I stayed in bed for the next three days. I had to call in sick to work, which was fine because I very rarely miss my shifts. But I wouldn't have cared either way. I was even deeper within the dullness now, like there were several inches of something between myself and the world. I could barely breathe through it. When I would get up for food, or to use the restroom, I felt more like a mannequin, pulling the corresponding string for each body part, and then like myself. I wondered why I was the one paying for all the suffering that I had discovered. On the fourth day, I willed myself out of bed. I got dressed, put my gear on, and headed out the door. I had somewhere to be. The 20 minute drive to Weatherford definitely improved my mood a bit. The stark scenery, flat land and trees, is calming sometimes. The Mineral Wells Public Library was closed indefinitely for repairs. Some issue with the contractors who were supposed to fix the roof. So the annual Mineral Wells Day presentation had been moved to Weatherford's Public Library. Our precinct likes its officers to participate in community events as much as possible, and this year was my turn to attend. The presentation concentrated on the rich history of Mineral Wells and the brave leaders that built it from a one-well town to a booming resort community. The irony did not escape me. J.A. Lynch was the ultimate hero of the day, but I knew otherwise. I sat in the back and listened off and on, but was mostly lost in my own thoughts. When it concluded, I stepped outside to speak briefly to one of the presenters to thank them for their support of our community, but the familiar face was already speaking to her. It was Mary Scott. I should have known I would see her here. We exchanged glances when she was done, and a moment later, she walked over to me and spoke. You look like hell, dear, she said, matter-of-factly. Oh, the honesty of southern women. She could obviously tell something was wrong. Appreciate that, I joked. A little levity never hurt anyone. Mary, I found the files in the basement at the hospital. Dr. Norwood and his nurse were performing experiments on young children and sending the parents over to Milling Sanatorium to get rid of the witnesses. Mary looked at me intently. I know, she said. A dagger shoved into my gut wouldn't have done any more damage than her words had. So I had risked my life and sanity in that basement. For what? Some sick game she was playing? She looked around to see if anyone was listening, then motioned for me to follow her around the corner of the building. I had a mind to walk off, but followed against my better judgment. Only half of me hoped you'd find them. The other half, well, I'm sorry I didn't tell you. I had my reasons then and there. She paused, trying to find the right word. Consequences for talking about the events of Mineral Wells past. From the living and the dead. Remember how I said I no longer drank the mineral water? Well, I did for many years of my life, which makes me vulnerable. She stopped and pulled up the sleeve on the shirt she was wearing. I saw two long, lengthwise cuts that went from her wrist almost to her elbow, almost healed. They were just deep enough to bleed and scar, but not deep enough to hit any major veins. I did them myself, two days after our conversation, but I don't remember doing it. A warning, I suppose. From whom? I said, feeling the guilt rising inside me. I had gone from being angry at her to feeling sorry for her that quickly. My emotions were very unstable as of late. She hesitated briefly, like Stan had, then continued. Did those files mention Dr. Norwood's nurse? Mariana, I answered. She was my grandmother. The realization hit me like a bombshell. No wonder she didn't want to tell me. It also explained how she knew about the files and everything else. She went on. She came to Mineral Wells in 1910, seeking treatment for her mental disorder. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but my mother said she had heard voices. 
Mariana was only 24 then. I guess Dr. Norwood thought he could use her. She had my mother Elise, six years later. She paused again. I'm sorry, Mary. You don't have to tell me all this. It's too dangerous. My voice cracked. Yes, I do. It's time the truth came out. Growing up, you always think your parents are perfect. After you get a little older, you start to notice things about them. My mom was missing several fingers on her right and left hands. They had operated on her when she was a child. I found out later. She had other scars too. Mary was beginning to cry. By her own mother? I asked, incredulous. Yes. Which is how I know the same could happen to me. I saw my grandmother in my dreams, the night I got these scars. I heard the bell, which meant it was time for one of the children to go with Mariana. It was my turn. She was now sobbing. I put my arms around her. The past is never dead, I thought. She wiped her eyes. Why my mother named me after her, I'll never understand. But perhaps she didn't either. She pulled away, then turned back around. Oh, there's one last thing. I tried to tell you the last time we spoke. You need to see Madame Teresa. She's here in Weatherford and does psychic readings. Pay no mind to the surface of what you see. That's only for the tourist. Teresa is an old soul. She should be able to help you. I almost balked, but thought better of it. If I had seen and heard the dead with my own eyes and ears, it wasn't a huge leap to believe that someone else could speak to them. Thank you. I'll do it. I agreed. I hope she can help you the rest of the way. I have given you all I can. She looked like she meant it. It wasn't hard to find Miss Teresa. She was, after all, the only local business with a sign that bore the image of two hands holding a crystal ball, even if she was located several miles from the city limits. I still had my doubts, but I had no other option at this point. The small shop had seen better days. The carpet was purple and faded, and beads and other baubles hung from the low ceiling, haphazardly. The smell of eulipus and cinnamon filled the air, covering the smell of the cats that tramped around the room, for the most part at least. The sign inside said, by appointment only, but I hope she already knew I was coming. I took a seat at the large, ornately carved wooden table in the center of the room. That's when a woman appeared from behind the curtain in front of me. She wore a long dress, with a hood on the back. She was dark-haired, and her wrinkled, sagging skin was the same. I could not see her eyes. She wore a mask over them. But instead of eye holes, the mask was solid, with eyes finally painted in their correct places. It was supremely unnerving, like looking at a life-size doll that had come to life. Mary sent me, was all I could muster. I see, she replied. Come with me. And with that, she disappeared behind the curtain again. I slowly got up and followed her back. The room behind the curtain was much smaller than the main room, with only a small, simple wooden table in the middle. In the four corners of the room were small painted statues depicting animals. Totems, I believe they are called. A goose, a mountain lion, a hummingbird, and a gopher. I recognized the eyes. They were the same that had been painted on Teresa's mask. She was already seated at the table, so I sat down across from her. I noticed her hands were as wrinkled and weathered as I had ever seen, but gentle somehow. I tried to focus on them. Looking at her face scared me. I sensed that she could feel my discomfort. We didn't have to speak about Mary or my purpose here. It was clear she understood. Can you speak to the dead? I managed to squeak out. I, I have spoken to them. Dead, you say? There is no death. There is only a change of worlds. That is what my people believe. Her voice rolled slowly and rhythmically, like a train rolling over its tracks. Why are they in mineral wells, and why are they tormenting the living? When man leaves this world, he passes into the spirit realm. Spirits are always around us but the dead are not powerless. 
They can be incited to violence, just as man can. Mineral wells in the water it is named after are cursed, but the exact source of this curse is hidden to me. I do have my guesses though. In Pueblo mythology, there is a spirit known as Pashini. I believe it is similar to the spirit depicted in the Christian Bible, who appears as a snake in the Garden of Eden. Pashini is known as an interloper. His purpose is to create strife. It was he who tempted the first humans and disrupted their harmony with nature. I believe whomever first coaxed the mineral-rich water from the depths of the earth may have been visited by Pashini. A deal may have been struck. The water would bring great wealth, but there would be a price. When the first man used the water to deceive those who honestly sought it, the price was exacted. The water was cursed, and all those who died in mineral wells while seeking the water would remain to exact their own vengeance against the ancestors of those who brought about their deaths. If it wasn't Pushini, it may have been some other earth demon. In the end, it is of no consequence. It was ultimately man's lust for power and unsatisfiable greed that cursed Mineral Wells. I replayed all the strange events I had encountered during my time in Mineral Wells in my mind. Virginia Brown, James's great-grandmother, Mariana, and the man at the VA, and even the children, all had come to Mineral Wells seeking treatment for something. There were others that I was unsure of, like the spirits involved in Fort Walter's suicide. Brad Delaney's murder of his wife, and the lawnmower accident, but I had a hunch that those spirits had done the same. If I wasn't truly numb before, and I was now, my eyes seemed to roll in my head. I'm not sure if I passed out, but all of a sudden, Teresa's hands were on mine. There is a dark cloud over you, you must be careful, she said cryptically. I looked around the room, trying to concentrate on something and my eyes locked on the gopher totem. Although she couldn't see me, she knew. The totems, yes. They are for protection. My people believe that spirit animals can guard man from evil. They guard this room. One for water, one for mountain, one for air, and one for earth. The gopher guards the ground. Hopefully, he will guard you too. But your eyes... I started, not thinking clearly. I can see better without them. I slowly regained my composure and stood up. Teresa put her arms around me and guided me into the main room. As I was about to leave, she spoke again. There is something else. I hesitate to say this to you in your condition, but I must. You have a friend in grave danger. She... I was already out the door stumbling to my squad car. I arrived at Mary's house about 15 minutes later. It was evening, and the sun was creeping behind the horizon, painting the sky with multicolored hues of lavender and red. I didn't notice any of her dogs running about as I pulled up with my lights on and sirens blasting, neglecting to turn them off as I exited the vehicle. I drew my weapon instinctively, even though it had a little chance of protecting me or Mary from an evil spirit. I slowly crept toward the door and found it unlocked. I was barely seeing clearly at this point, but found my way inside. My boots squished on the floor of the living room. I looked down to find the carpet soaked with so much blood that it had created a standing puddle, one that I was forced to walk through rather than around. This went against every bit of my training, but I was not thinking clearly at this time. The dullness had almost overcome me. It was then I noticed there were body parts floating in the sea of red. A tongue, a foot, an eye. I retched once, then again. In a daze, I followed the trail of blood through the living room and into the kitchen. It was worse there. The entire floor was red, and there were more body parts. Pieces of flesh and bone may be more accurate. It was hard to make out anything among the gore. The smell of death permeated the air, or was that only my fear? Through my tears, I found my way through the kitchen and around the small island in the center. It was there 
I found Mary, or what was left of her, slumped against the far cabinets. Her face wasn't hers anymore. It seemed to me like some professionally done movie prop. Her nose had been sliced cleanly off, and there were two bloody holes where her eyes had been. I wished I had Teresa's mask to cover them up. Maybe then she could see again like Teresa. The truth finally sank in. This was all my fault. I had dragged Mary into this, and she had lost her life helping me. I had killed her. My knees collapsed, and I sank into the grime. My hand landed on something cold and slippery that appeared to have fallen from Mary's hand. A large kitchen cleaver. They found me, covered in gore and vomit, right where I had collapsed. The neighbors had gotten tired of the constantly blaring sirens and called the police. James was there, along with several other officers. Jesus Christ, man. It's a bloodbath in here. What happened? He asked incredulously. It was too late. I tried to stop it. I whispered as he pulled me up onto my feet. Who did this? It was... But I couldn't put the words together. What could I say? Is any of this your blood? Are you hurt? No, I'm fine. I'm not fine, I thought. In minutes, the whole team was there, rolling out the yellow tape, photographing everything, and collecting evidence. In a small town like Mineral Wells, you won't see everyone in hazmat suits, dusting things for fingerprints and setting up lasers that show the trajectory of bullets and such. The investigators do mostly everything, and they do it really well most of the time. Although I would have hated to be the guy that had to collect all those body parts. My clothes, shoes, and the rest of the gear I was wearing were collected in clear plastic bags. I was photographed from head to toe, and blood swabs were taken. Because I was an officer, I was allowed to go home and shower before heading up to the precinct to give my statement. I know that any other civilian would have been arrested on the spot. I arrived at the precinct, showered and clean-shaven, my black satchel on my shoulder. I was taken back to the room where we interviewed criminals, asked to sit, and offered a cup of coffee. I politely declined. We have a little camcorder that is set up in the corner that was switched on after the tedious process of deleting some old interviews. I was nervous at that point. Shouldn't I be meeting with a superior to simply give my statement? Instead, I was read my Miranda rights. I decided to decline my right to have an attorney present while I was questioned. I had nothing to hide. Looking back now, I realized that was my first mistake. But considering the almost catatonic emotional state I had been in for some time, logic and reason had deserted me, and the fire inside me, the one inside all of us that urges us to fight at all costs, have been all but extinguished. I told my story from beginning to end, the possessions, the experiments, and even what Teresa said. All of it. It had to come out. I showed them the files as proof. I pleaded with my fellow officers to stop drinking the water and to start looking into the strange occurrences in mineral wells. I begged them to help me shut down the company, bottling and shipping this cursed water across the country. They played along, maybe just to keep me talking. But the looks I got when I explained Mary had mutilated herself, well, let's just say they weren't friendly. I'm sure you can imagine how it went. Why were you at her home that night? A psychic told me she was in danger. Officer rolls eyes and scoffs. Sure, buddy. We believe you. Now tell us about these ghosts you saw again. Afterwards, I was placed on temporary leave and taken to a holding cell. The next several weeks were a blur. I was placed under official arrest soon after my interview and held without bond. Can you blame them? It was a gruesome scene. I was covered in blood. It appeared as if I had handled the murder weapon. And hell, she was cut into pieces for Christ's sakes. 
The medical examiner stated that no human would have been able to survive long enough to do that to themselves without bleeding out. Plus, even if she could have, why would Mary have done this to herself? It made no sense. I learned later that my arrest was never reported, but I wasn't surprised. Can you imagine how a local cop arrested for mutilation a retired teacher would have gone over in the local paper? The MWPD would have had to deal with a shitstorm, the likes of which they had never experienced before. Controversies like that don't go away very easily, if ever, in small towns like Mineral Wells. Luckily, the grand jury was meeting that month, so I didn't have long to wait. My case was fast-tracked and quickly presented. To no one's surprise, the grand jury returned a true bill. I was indicted for murder under Texas Penal Code 1902. It can carry up to life in prison. As you can imagine, getting indicted for murder for a crime you didn't commit is a crushing feeling. What's worse is that I knew I had no chance to convince anyone that I was innocent. The NWPD had the files, which didn't really prove anything anyway, but I knew they would never see the light of day again. Even if Stan and Teresa could have come forward with some other credible evidence, there is no way they would be believed. The veil would prevent it. So I sat alone in my cell, mostly crying, often sleeping, receding deeper into the dullness, pretending this was all a dream. I slept in restless fits, racked by night terrors. And at this point, my friends, I have to make a confession. This will be my first of two confessions, and is in fact the only thing I am guilty of. I have deceived you. I am no longer a police officer in Texas, as the title of the post suggests, although you may have guessed that already. I apologize for this sincerely. If I had told you my current and true situation up front, it's likely you wouldn't have listened to my story. I needed you to believe me. One of the foundations of the criminal justice system in this country is that to be found guilty of an offense, you have to have had a rational understanding of what you were doing at the time. After a hearing, motioned for by my attorney, the court found that I was in fact not competent to stand trial for what I had done. He presented evidence of erratic behavior from the time I had arrived in the mineral wells up through the night of the murder. Some of it was true, some of it wasn't. I'm almost positive my attorney personally thought I was guilty and mentally sound, but he successfully painted the picture of a stressed out cop who had simply snapped. This was perfect for the district attorney's office and the MWPD. There would be no public trial. No one would find out about the psychotic officer who cut an innocent woman into pieces. Texas, like other states, provides for a different type of punishment for people who fall into this category. Which brings me to my second confession. I am currently confined in a secure mental facility, serving a 40 year term of commitment for a crime I did not commit. I only have access to my phone every couple of days and at certain times, which is why I've had to break up these posts into multiple parts. You may be surprised I have access to it at all, but you shouldn't be. Inmate smuggling cell phones into prison is an enormous problem in today's justice system. The problem is, when the guards are all in on it, they make a little money by helping the inmate or looking the other way, and of course deny everything if the inmate is caught. It didn't take much money to bribe my orderly into letting me use mine on occasion. I had plenty saved, considering I was single, had no social life, and never ate or drank out. I was able to contact Stan through his garage and have him deliver money for me. He got a small cut too. Human greed, right? I'm also sorry that this may not have ended how you hoped. I think Hollywood movies have conditioned us to believe conflicts always resolve tidily often to the benefit of the protagonist. If you just believe, or strive hard enough, or fight long enough, you'll win. They have to, or otherwise people wouldn't continue to watch them. That's a good thing, for the most part. There will be no happy ending here. Unfortunately, life isn't always like that. It's dark, gruesome, and unfair more often than we'd like to admit. And we have to live with the scars. There will be no justice for Mary. Those children. 
or any of the victims in Mineral Wells, Texas. There will certainly be no justice for me. I fell victim to something even more sinister than the curse. Hope. The idea that we can change things. That we can make the wrong right again. I was wrong about the nature of the world, and it cost me everything. One previous commenter described the hopelessness and despair the parents must have felt when they were sent to Milling Sanatorium after watching their children scream in agony on that operating table. And that's the feeling that haunts me now. The meds I am administered every day at 9 and 3 help some. I'm numb, mostly, and I can sleep. I wouldn't have been able to live with the night terrors. Thankfully, the dullness has mostly faded away. I see it's time for me to go. I must leave you, dear reader, this time for good. It's time for one of my treatments. Yes, I have those too. Some traditional, and some experimental. But they will have to be tales for another day. I've actually gotten used to the screams here. Even though they echo in my dreams.